first thing in the intro, you, you kind of brushed over it, but you said you did this film instead of therapy. And I think we all need a little bit of context there. So you were in Afghanistan before? Yeah, it's a crazy thing, but um, it took so long for this thing to get it set up and I never believed it would happen. That actually in the time it took for the script to circulate around and ultimately fall into the hands of fucking Harvey Weinstein, um, I'd given up on the film industry and had um, run away to the, um, the Afghan war and had joined the Mujahid. Which is nicer than Harvey Weinstein. I'd yeah, say. much. <laughs> and one of the, f yeah, it's a, that's a decision I don't regret. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, right in the middle of that, in fact, it was in a, um, a Saudi Red Crescent hospital. Someone managed to get a phone call to me to say that they were making hardware and um, could I come back and make this, this Android movie, which was super difficult at the time because I'd actually lost my passport and my identity and it was very hard to escape from where I was and get back to, uh, to London. But then when I did, I was plunged straight into um, storyboarding and shooting the movie, so there was no real um, transition period between the two, which I think is what um, makes the film stand up. Uh, this is now uh, considered a cult classic, rightfully so, but I'd, I'd like to talk about how fast and how cheap this movie was made, because it looks incredible, the world building is incredible, but can you, t like, how much time did you have and how much money did you have? I'm just curious. six weeks and it was made for 800 grand. So under one million. Um, we didn't know what we were doing, so we just went straight in and it was um, released, I think, the same year as um, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which was like 120 million. So we could have made, um, presumably, um, 120 hardwares for the, um, <laughs> the cost of the competition. I remember when it came out here, the video cassette kind of unrightfully sold it as a Terminator ripoff, which is it, it's not really. But there is a lot of influences in there, and uh, we, we know each other a little bit. I know your influence, influences are not just from movies, like there's comic book influences. Could you talk a little bit about what inspired hardware? Um, yeah, I think Terminator was the obvious one because it had an Android in it. Uh, and that was what was going on at the time. We were determined to make it not look like a James Cameron movie, so we um, banned all turquoise and blue and all, all kind of gray, um, normal Terminator lighting from it, and we decided to um, do it entirely in, yeah, mostly shades of red, and um, drew heavily on um, Italian horror movies instead. It's really a, um, an Italian um, slasher movie in disguise, I think, and that it still um, follows a sort of, um, character locked in a single location being stalked by an invisible killer with power drills, chainsaws, etc. kind of format, even though it's yeah, set in the future. And then um, I guess comic book wise that goes all the way back to um, the um, Warren comic books, the Creepies, Eeries and Vampirellas that were around when I was oh young right. because I think it was those and the um, particularly an artist named Vaughan Bodie who did some of those covers which um, introduced me to the fluorescent day glow oranges and the uh, the bright uh, in insane color schemes and that and also wanting to make movies that were a fusion of um, science fiction horror and fantasy without any real um, generic definition between them so yeah a lot, a lot of things feeding into it but really it's also ticking boxes of um, the Mad Max franchise um, spaghetti westerns there's all kinds of crazy things in the in the mix yeah, uh, I recently discovered the artist Boris Vallejo, uh, the, the, the painter, which has this mechanical hand. I don't know if he was a direct influence, but that was one of the things I thought, like, oh, maybe Richard saw that. Clearly not, because you're looking at me with this weird stare. Yeah, I can't so. remember the mechanical <laughs> hand. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a Frank Prezetta fan, though. Yes, um, Prezetta, Boris sure. Boris is kind of inf imitating, and um, there, there was a, um, there is a Frank Prezetta poster for hardware, which you may have seen. Oh yes, uh, it's great. Yeah, 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 yeah uh, which of course. unfortunately was abandoned by it was uh, it was crushed by Harvey and Bob Weinstein, who didn't understand who Frazetta was, and instead they um, released the movie in the States with like a, a close up of Dylan McDermott's eyes and the um, also great. <coughs> yeah, but yeah, still uh, it has always saddened me that yeah the Frazetta poster wasn't used. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I, I had the fortune to work with you on Colorado Space. We, we were side by side there, uh, which was amazing. Well, um, Jonas, in fact, shot much of the best material in Colorado Space because he was directing the, uh, the second unit. So uh, a, a huge amount of that movie was really shot. Mainly the alpacas, we have to be. Well, that's we not true. <laughs> all, all of those trees, the toads, um, so much. Yeah, but you did Nicolas Cage, which is, you know, 
the main part of the movie. But anyway, Some, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I was thinking I saw you butt head with butt head with pro- with the producers, which always happens, of course. Inevitably. <laughs> is there stuff in hardware or that didn't make it into hardware where you were is there a scene you particularly had to fight for because this is a movie full of ama- amazing images and and scenes but um it, it can be have uh, it wasn't an easy movie to make i can tell just by watching it was there something you had to particularly fight for or fought for well i guess the biggest battle on hardware was right at the beginning to um cast stacy travis as um, as jill um stacy was an unknown um and she had um as she'd been done some television sitcom before on the Julie Brown show, she was blonde and was do- basically playing a, a ditzy, stupid blonde on a, tele- a TV sitcom. And no, she had no um, cinematic track record to um, be able to prove she could play the part. And um, yeah, um, Harvey wanted to cast any number of like actresses that I guess owed him favors for one reason or another. <laughs> and um, uh, and I had to really dig in my heels to um, to get Stacy. That was a, um, a consistent battle at the at the very beginning. And um, and she's I, great. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't. I knew she would hold the whole movie together, and in a way, she does. It's uh, without Stacy, I think um, hardware would just be a bunch of scenes. So um, that was uh, kind of yeah, hugely important. And then um, there, there were there were insane ba- running battles all the way through with um, yeah Harvey and Bob. And I should say, I thought Bob was even scarier than Harvey of the two of them. He just kind of snuck off to one side and no one, no one really noticed he was around. But yeah, um, both of them. And um, <coughs> yeah, I guess um, they kept wanting to, um, wanting to make it more appealing to kids. <laughs> okay. um, which never made sense to me because I knew we were shooting like an X-rated or an R-rated movie. So um, <laughs> they kept wanting more kids in the film. And about three weeks in, they suggested that we should um, get rid of um, John Lynch's Shades character. They didn't like him. And Macaulay Culkin or something. No, they wanted to replace him with a dog. They oh, a dog. <laughs> if Dave Dillon had a, had a trained dog. That worked. Whoa. whoa. I'm okay. I, d- I didn't tell John Lynch the, uh, <laughs> that, which is obviously insane. Most of their suggestions were, were lunatic. I mean, you can't put a trained dog into a movie two weeks into the shoot on a budget like that. <laughs> and, uh, so um, much of it was just insane. And then um, <coughs> they were so insistent on this that they, were, that they eventually wrote a bunch of scenes with uh, involving kids. Uh, they themselves the wrote whole, this. A whole subplot of the film, which, which was not written by me, which they wanted us to shoot. Uh, and I refused to shoot it. And they tore two whole days out of my schedule and um, shot that stuff with another director. Uh, and then it exists. It exists. Footage. Yeah, and they tried to cut it into the film, but of course it didn't work. So all of it ended up on the cutting room floor. The net result is we lost two days out of the schedule, which um, we had so few days at all. Um, the loss of these two days are the reason that um, Alvi the dwarf does not get his head caught set on fire <laughs> and does not get caught in the metal shredder which would have been a full day to shoot, and I so wanted to feed the dwarf into the metal shredder. He was meant to <laughs> a cat to get... I know how you love to do that. So we lost that. It was very unfortunate. His body's just lying on the ground, and we never find out what happens to him. And, <laughs> and, um, yeah, Vernon, the younger security guard, was also destined for something much more painful. And again, it would have taken a whole day to do that to him. So those two deaths had to be pulled out of the movie in order to make room for the utterly useless scenes that uh, yeah, Harvey and Bob Weinstein shot. Have you ever seen that footage of the kids? Yeah, it, it floats around somewhere. It's just it's it's kind of a subplot with um, Mo get, um, getting beaten up on by a gang of kids in the, <laughs> in the foyer of the building, but it doesn't work for, for pacing reasons because it just doesn't cut into the rest of the narrative in a, a coherent way. So children are beating up the hero of hardware in those scenes. Pretty much, and then he beats them up, and it, it, it was ba- it was slackly directed. I wasn't directing it. I watched from the sidelines as they did it. It was much more over into a sort of um, Mad Max territory. Oh, I see. Yes. Uh, uh, um, there's apparently a Godard quote where he said that uh, everything you'll ever do in your career is already apparent in your first movie. And rewatching this uh, now, there's a lot of shots that uh, I see popping up in your career. Like there's a little things. Like there's a, a close up of a of a compass. That's also in Colorado space. Um, yeah, every single film I've ever made has a close-up of a compass that falls <laughs> on my credit. 
What, what do you mean? It always falls on the directed by credit. Oh, that seems intentional. Yeah, it's intentional. It's <laughs> in every, every single thing I've done so far. The compass is always off, which is to try and show people that that, uh, that it's the direction is all over the place. <laughs> I see. Uh, but also an overhead uh, shot of a, a woman being terrorized by a creature. That's in Colorado Space as well. That's in this movie. Yep. Uh, it's all these images that keep coming back, uh, which, you know, uh, another question, like uh, a lot of directors rewatching their stuff can only see the mistakes. Are you at a point with hardware where you can enjoy the movie or are you yeah. still seeing the mistakes? I'm still seeing the mistakes. I'm still feeling missing scenes, but <laughs> it doesn't feel as bad as it, as, it, as it did originally. I was utterly terrified when the film was first finished. It took um, a while for me to be able to watch it carefully, properly. I guess the f um, it took about eight months for me to be able to relax into seeing it. This was probably the second screening at the Cannes Film Festival. The first screening, I was super tense. And then the second screening, when hopefully no one important was going to be there, I, I finally relaxed. And in fact, I, I, t I think I took half a tab of acid. Uh, that would make sense, um, yes. A, a, and it finally all made sense. Uh, and then, uh, Your own movie made sense yeah, to you yeah, after you took acid. So the movie's <laughs> only like 95 minutes long. So uh, I came out of the screening utterly scrambled. and. Um, Harvey Weinstein was in the foyer and he just looked so terrifying to me or, or tripping. He, he looked like some kind of troll or ogre and um, I, I panicked and ran. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but yeah, running in, in terror through the, the Cannes Film Festival. Speaking of trolls, there's like the most unpleasant character in this movie is the neighbor. Yeah. And you said he was a very, it's a very prescient movie. But like that's just an internet troll. He doesn't have a Twitter account. He has a telescope. That guy is very much of today's era. I think the the fat neighbor. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was based on a lot of different um, real people. <laughs> a lot of different real people. Yeah, it was kind of a fusion. There is a bit of Harvey in there. Um, uh, Lincoln Weinberg Jr. Um, <laughs> but um, there was also a, a, a creepy guy like that who was um, hassling us when we were teenagers, going to the late night movies, and it was continuously out in the parking lot and every time we're sneaking out to have a joint it was like oh you, you guys smoke a lot of dope i see you etc etc <laughs> and i stole some of his lines from this this creepy guy that i remember when i was about 14. <laughs> uh let's take some questions from the audience yeah, if that's please. okay that's just a man standing up and walking away any questions at all uh, yeah. Come on, you know, Back there. Ask him. Hey, uh, yeah, did you get influenced by um, 2000 AD at all? You know, the British sci-fi comic 2000 AD. There was a short future shock in there that I heard um, talked about in relation to Yeah, that's to totally hardware. in there. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a weird, uh, 2000 AD occupies a weird place in this whole mess because... Um, a lot of, uh, basically, the, the Judge Dredd character for the um, first many years is drawn by a guy named Mike McMahon, who is in, was, in fact, my cousin, uh, which is very, it was very confusing for all of us. Uh, and, uh, it was when I was very, very young, I was seeing these, these initial Dredd pages, particularly the early Cursed Earth series, actually being drawn and still have um, several of the 2000 AD um, pages uh, literally in my collection. So, um, yeah, the t um, 2000 AD was certainly growing up in this period. Um, to put it in a fuller context, um, what had happened was um, I saw when I was a kid a movie named Soylent Green, and as a result of Soylent Green, I read the book that Soylent Green was based on, Make Room, Make Room, by Harry Harrison, which hugely inspired me as a teenager. Uh, at that time, I was making a long Super 8 movie, about an hour long, which was really ripping off um, Make Room, Make Room. And simultaneously, my cousin was um, drawing Judge Dredd. And um, I guess all of that was in the, it was in the melting pot. And um, someone at some point um, suggested that um, I drop a killer robot into the <laughs> apartment. But no, this was also, it was either going to be a robot or an alien, because Alien and Terminator were the two movies that were floating around. The initial script I wrote involving the, f the, the future city was a little like Fat City in the 21st century. There was no action in it and no robot. It was set over Christmas Eve in the uh, Moe and Jill's apartment. And, Shades was tripping and it was already gloomy and depressing. 
kind of funny, but still kind of hopeless, like um, the Harry Harrison novel. And um, nobody wants to make it. And the general suggestion all around was that we should drop the android into the, into the script. So uh, yeah, it was sort of simultaneous, but I still think that 2000 AD um, owes a huge debt to the people who were there before them. Like um, the cursed earth strip, I remember, was, that was happening round about then, was really knocking off um, Roger Zelazny's Damnation Alley, the novel like, um, pretty much beat for beat, and someone really ought to shoot um, Zelazny's um, book one day, because it's fabulous, no relation to the awful movie they made from Damnation Alley, the book's great. So, um, <coughs> yeah, um, Dread had its influences. And right now, I'm also very interested in um, a, a Dan O'Bannon um, Mobius comic book, um, The Long Tomorrow, which I don't think has gotten its due. It's um, arguably the first time I've, I've seen a, um, a future city, um, like Mega City One or the city in hardware, or indeed um, the city in Blade Runner. We, have to, we can't forget that Blade Runner was a, a massive influence at that point as well. On you as well, like yeah, the, the on scenes on of Mo arriving seem very uh, really Yeah, on, I think yeah. on me and on, on everyone. I yeah. mean, I think everyone was, it affected everyone's hair for about three years. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from the audience? How did Lemmy and Iggy Pop get involved? Well, somehow hardware developed a kind of weird gravity where people kept getting drawn into it. And um, yeah, John Lydon and Public Image Limited were kind of there from the beginning. And I think that drew um, Iggy Pop in. But the, um, the fact of the matter is that originally we'd cast um, Sinead O'Connor as the taxi driver. Um, Sinead O'Connor was then in her bald phase and we were hoping it would be, it would be, we could do a sort of tank girl kind of thing. We kind of wanted to be tank girl driving the, um, the, uh, the river taxi. And um, then at the last moment, um, Sinead O'Connor suddenly changed her mind and dropped out, had a, a conflict of interest or a conflict of dates. So at about 24 hours in advance, everyone was desperately looking for a Sinead O'Connor replacement. Um, so obviously it's yeah, Lemmy. Somebody <laughs> had, had Lemmy's number. And, um, <laughs> Lemmy agreed to do it for a bottle of Jack Daniels, um, which he completely consumed before coming on set. And, um, <laughs> The, um, the other part of the Lemmy story, because it's, it's a tiny cameo, but he, ha he had a rail magnum. The, um, the gun in his holster was rail. <laughs> uh, I mean, he'd, he'd had the whole bottle of Jack Daniels, and he was, we came on set and we strapped on, it was by the Thames River in a, a place called Spiller's Wharf. We strapped on the gun, and he was so happy to have that magnum that um, he immediately drew it from the holster to show off, and in one fluid Zen movement, he drew it, and it flew out of his hand, straight into the Thames River. <laughs> and, uh, we sent down a unit diver to try and retrieve it, and it was lost in the salt at the bottom of the river. We never found it, and the, the movie has got like a, I think a, a bit of w a wood painted black stuck in the, in the holster. Uh, but very, uh, super good man. And there's another musical connection, because isn't the Zone Trooper uh, the guy from Fields of the Nephilim? That's true, yeah, yeah. it's Carl McCoy from Fields of the Nephilim, underne underneath the gas mask. We, um, had, we managed to save up just enough money from the 800 grand to be able to fly eight of us to the Sahara Desert at the end of the movie, because we figured if the entire film was in this one-room apartment, it was just too much, we needed to open it out. And, and um, we, we, I went with yeah, Carl McCoy to the Sahara Desert to shoot the top and tail of the film, which was, yeah, super strange. We, of course, were hit by flash floods and freak storms. Uh, the, the sky at the end isn't a matte painting. It's, uh, it's, it's completely real, yeah. Those are some indelible images, so I'm very happy you, you made that decision. They're, they're, yeah, what's seared in my mind as well. When I think of hardware, I think of that opening for sure. And that was kind of really the genesis of hardware in some way because um, it was a dream originally. I had when I was about 13, and that dream was just the opening um, 10 minutes with the guy in the hat and coat searching in the desert and, uh, and searching in the, land, in the minefield. Uh, and I, don't, I didn't know what he was looking for, and he started digging and found this, um, this metal skull with camera eyes, which was yeah, a, a dream from when I was super young. Amazing. Anything else from the audience? Sir. Uh, 
Uh, I'd like to imagine so, but it, it could just be a coincidence. I mean, I was influenced by the um, so much of the artwork from the 1970s, and I, th I think, in the, uh, to some extent, also by it, this calls all the way back to Silent Green, which um, uses um, quite heavy filtration to try to get a sense of um, the disappearance of the gr of the ozone layer, the greenhouse effect. But yeah, I would like to imagine so. Anyone else? I have a final question if no one from the audience has anything. Oh, there we go. How was the film received at the time? How is it overrated? How was it received uh, when it came out, hardware? Um, well, I think it was um, kind of loathed by the mainstream critics. I, I don't recall us getting um, a single good review from any of the, um, any of the main critics. Um, certainly, um, most of them thought it was um, basically an extended music video. Um, I remember um, a guy called Steve Jones, who's the um, the guy who runs the Fred Fist, right? What, yeah, no. one of them. Yeah, yeah. I was I had a party afterwards. I'm um, literally coming up to me and shoving me in the chest of his finger. He was very drunk, saying, "You know what you are? You're a failure. You're a fucking failure. That's what you are." The the um, the um, response initially was pretty rough, um, but the, the the two that really lifted it out of that was um, Fangoria magazine, which gave it, which said it was film of the year, and Fango gave it a lot of coverage. And the first really good review we got was from um, Joe Bob Briggs, who gave it um, a yeah, really great review, and um, that was when it started turning around. It was kind of the uh, yeah the American um, gore um, horror scene that I guess um, responded to Hardware, and that was also because Hardware got an X rating when it came out. The X rating still nice. existed, <laughs> and it was one of the last films to receive an X rating because it, was, it enabled us to um, do a huge um, campaign of going around um, cable shows and radio shows and campaigning against the X rating. And um, I think the X rating got it more attention in America than it, it might have gained otherwise. And anyone else? Hey, hey. Uh, I'm wondering how did the Indian divinity image, like how did that get into there? Like what's the symbolism behind it? Yeah, the destroyer. Yeah. Uh, see, on some level, the droid kind of wants to be Kali or uh, wants to become the destroyer god. So yeah, yeah, there's, okay, there's, yeah. There's an aspect mm. of that for sure. And it's, uh, it, it, it has that multi armed qu um, quality, especially when it gets onto the console. It feels like it wants to be a kind of a living icon or a, um, a living altar. And. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, really, um, I guess, also um, try to do Moe's death um, as a kind of a first-person experience. And um, there was a sense of incorporating the, the Tibetan tanker. Mm. And um, we were very, very cautious with that because we were frightened that um, if we um, misrepresented it, um, it might bring terrible bad luck on the production. So I recall we were very, very careful with the colors when we did the... Um, the low resolution black and white uh, um, prints for the dubbing process. We had to make certain that the destroyer god shots were in color and in proper resolu resolution. Uh, we treated it cautiously. I can say from first hand experience when Richard makes a movie, magic is real as long as they're <laughs> shooting. So you have to be very careful about demonic forces and stuff like that. So yeah, because it can blow back at you pretty bad. The Tibet the Tibetan what? It was a Tibetan tanker. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so it's a religious, it's a bit of religious artwork. Uh, it was, it was in fact painted by um, Graham Humphreys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who's, uh, who's on the credits as a storyboard artist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who's also also storyboarded the movie and who um who is really in, in real life the guy who painted the original posters for Evil Dead. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Street. Incredible artist. Yeah, yes. yeah an, incre an incredible poster artist. But he really wanted to um, express his um, his Buddhist views and. Mm -hmm. um, that's created this uh, uh, this incredible tanker for um, for Shades' bedroom. Yeah, yeah, I'm really impressed by the symbolism and like uh, there's a lot behind it. Really impressed. Yeah, and it was kind of pulling that together with the Mandelbrot set, where you know, the all that fractal stuff was um, very very fresh in '89. Um, in fact, at that point in time, hardware does the very first, the, the trip sequence does the very first move into the um, Mandelbrot set anyone had done at that point. Where we had to, it took about a, 
I don't know, two, three days to generate every single frame of the thing. And um, yeah, all of the crude um, computer work was, I think, done on a school computer. <laughs> it, it's worth noting that we were all incredibly young at that point in time. The average age on set was um, 16. Um, That's illegal, Richard. Right, uh, it's true, and, <laughs> and I have to say that but the, the best of our gore boys, the kids who were doing the gore work, um, was in fact Chris Cunningham, who went on to do the Aphex Twins videos, but Chris was, um, we called him Little Chris. Is he credited on the, on the movie? Uh, um, it's credited under his real name, but okay. I can't say what that is. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, check the credits, <laughs> um, but yeah, Little Chris, um, who went on to do the Aphex videos, he was 15 years old on hardware. Uh, and he would work on Judge Ritt not much later, right? Yeah, yeah. And before you worked on hardware, although you were still only 15 at the time of the shoot, he'd already been on um, on Nightbreed and on Clive Barker's um, Hellraiser, and he'd already been on, um, I think, Rawhead Rex. So he already had a track record by Jesus the time Christ. he was 15. Um, from hardware, he managed to gravitate onto um, Stanley Kubrick's AI while Kubrick was still alive. Um, that experience was so horrific that that's when he decided he was going to start directing for himself. <laughs> it was just, uh, yeah, I think he was on AI for about one year before Kubrick died, and it was just too much for him. So it's just one step to Kubrick, to Chris Cunningham. So that's clo how close you are to Kubrick, really. Yeah, yeah uh, I don't know, Ben, but I know that um, little Chris turned 16 in the course of the shoot. He had his <laughs> 16th birthday on the shoot. Uh, I remember he was complaining because we were working him too hard. And, <laughs> um, so I told the, um, the set security guy to physically pick him up and carry him out of the building. And thro he, uh, the guy threw him in the skip outside. That was, he, that was his 16th birthday. But yeah, we were all very young, and that's <laughs> how they got away with um, paying so little for the movie. We were all very, we had a l put a lot of energy into it. And yeah, I guess it, it pays off because at least I'm still alive now and yeah, not as old as I might be. <laughs> Uh, final question from me. You, you've teased uh, a few times to me a potential sequel to this movie called, can I say the title? Yeah, you can. Uh, called Malware, right? Oh no, you got it wrong. Oh. Uh, yeah. So I shouldn't have said there it. There is then. a movie, there is an unmade, a produced script called Malware yeah. set in the same world, but it's not a sequel to Hardware. Oh, okay. There is a Hardware sequel script, which has been officially called Hardware 2 Ground Zero for years and years. It was like Droids 2 Earth No. <laughs> but um, th yeah, this was written about one year after Hardware, and um, it's been trapped in legal hell ever since. For the last 30 years, we've been trying to um, get the rights to actually um, do the damn sequel. Um, hardware, thanks to the involvement of yeah, Evil Harvey, um, uh, is at this point in time very hard to find. Um, there's no one really, I think, uh, in Europe who will even own up to owning it. <laughs> Um, and um, trying to get the rights to um, to even make a T-shirt or a um, to to produce a droid um, model or anything, it so far has been impossible. We've been uh, unable to create merchandising for it. I'm very much hoping that before I die, we'll finally be able to overcome the um, the, the nightmare um, web of legal issues left behind by Miramax, because the um, the Hardware 2 sequel script is, I believe, the best thing I've ever written. I wrote it about uh, uh, pretty much that same year, and it retains the um, the same energy as, as hardware, but I thought it was going to be more expensive, and I, I wanted to top the original, so it, it's brutal um, beyond belief, and also um, takes the, um, the, the, the droids in a direction I don't think anyone else has foreseen. I remember we had a drone on Colorado Space, it went up into the sky, you pointed to it and said, this might happen in hardware too, flying flying robots. Is that, yeah, is that a spoiler? A, a little, uh, but yeah, the main thing in the Hardware 2 script is they're mass-produced and they're weaponized. And uh, this one's not weaponized, it's in pieces. And um, they're um, yeah, not only weaponized, they're also um, operating as a team and they, which they're capable of um, yeah, fully remote action and they're capable of yeah, adjusting to their environment, but they also can be overridden by obviously by a, a, dr a droid or a drone operator. And I was very interested in how you'd get to be a, a droid operator and who these people would be. So I, I figured there were going to be teenagers who were trained <laughs> up on um, droid simulation software. 
uh, who are probably on, on weird drugs, um, designer RNA or um, some kind of uh, yeah, um, stuff that was enabling them to um, run like five or ten droids at once while simultaneously like um, trying to buy a present for their girlfriend on eBay and checking their Facebook messages. So um, I think the, the Hardware 2 script's pretty nightmarish and it's, it's set about 25 years later and um, also um, resolves what eventually happens to Shades and Jill. And also Harvey would have gotten his kids movie, which would have been great. Yeah, to, to some extent, yeah. <laughs> it, was very, it, was, it was very looking forward, I think, to what's actually happening. The other thing is that, um, it w which the Hardware 2 script got right, is the, dro the droids, like the drones, would be um, deployed initially to patrol perimeters because they're pretty stupid at the end of the day. They've got motion detectors and they're heat sensitive. They're not that smart. So I figured the first place you'd see them would be um, like on the containment wall between Israel and Palestine or um, uh, on the Tex-Mex border where there's um, yeah, thousands of miles of desert and places which human beings don't want to have to patrol. And I also figured that um, no one wants to see um, uniformed human soldiers actually killing people or killing Mexicans on um, American soil, so it makes a lot, lot of sense to use drones, um, to use drone soldiers. So I'm not at all surprised that, now, that DARPA is now suggesting that they should um, yeah, deploy um, um, drone soldiers on the on the Tex-Mex border, it seems um, kind of almost a sickening inevitability. But I, w I would like to see um, Ground Zero actually um, come to pass someday, or at least be, be legally able to um, turn the script into a comic book or um, get it out there in some way, because I'm frightened that if we don't, it will um, inevitably happen. <laughs> and on that uplifting note, thank you, <laughs> Richard Stanley. Well, thank you, one and all. Thank you.